Good morning, everybody. Uh, very warm welcome indeed to Holy Trinity Church this morning. It's so good to have you with us, to join with us as we come to hear uh, from God's word, as we come to meet uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I pray that we will meet him this morning. Uh, welcome to anybody who's new with us. Uh, it's so good to have you. Welcome to our young people. We absolutely love to have people who are young and who are older, uh, people of all ages joining us here in our church family. Welcome to those who are online as well to share with us this morning. And uh, if anyone doesn't know who I am, I'm Nick Weir, I'm the vicar here. And today we're going to be continuing our journey through the exciting and challenging story of the first book of Samuel. And uh, we look forward to Stephen preaching to us later on. Uh, we're also going to be sharing communion, bread and wine together uh, later in our service. Our creche is open through those doors, first on the right, if uh, anybody needs to make use of that, older or younger. And uh, later on in our service, our children and our teens will be invited to their groups. But let's pray for our time together now. Loving Father, Almighty God, we thank you that we can gather in your name this morning to hear your word, to be pointed towards your Son. And so be with us, we pray. Uh, help us to meet you as you are and to respond in faith, in love, in obedience, and in service of you here and in our world. And we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, all through the story of the Old Testament and through the book of Samuel, we're seeing that God is faithful. He doesn't change. Uh, we might change. We might be unfaithful, but he always keeps his word. And that's what our first uh, couple of hymns uh, are going to point us to. First, great is thy faithfulness. And then secondly, an encouragement for us to put our trust in the Lord Jesus. So let's stand and sing with our music group as they come to lead us this morning. Thank you. Oh, I have. 
Please do take a seat. And uh, yes, I'd love to invite Jordan to come 
and share some words with us. Thank you, Jordan. Wonderful. Well, where is Polly, our friend over here? Polly, I hear that you're just not feeling fantastic today. No, no, I'm not. Oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. I hope that something better happens to you today. Okay. Well, guys, I have a plan to make Polly feel better today, okay? And if, as long as everybody listens to my plan, everything will go fine. So, Lois, I need you. So, I've heard that Polly really likes red apples, okay? So, could you go and find me a red apple, please? Thank you. I see. This is a pear. Why did you get me a pear? Were there any red apples? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. Well, okay. Katka, could you, I need your help. I would like to draw Polly a really nice uh, a card so it will make her feel better. So you could just draw a, a nice smiley face on this and we'll give it to her later. And then Miles, I'm going to give this to you. And then when we're ready, I want you to ring it five times so that Polly will come and get the card and all the, the nice stuff that we've got here, okay? I'll give you a thumbs up. Oh. This is a sad face. Why did you draw a sad face? Oh, okay, thanks. Go sit down. Well, at least we've got two things for Polly now. So as long as Miles rings the bell five times, Polly can come and collect it. We can give it to her. Maybe she'll be happy with it anyway. So Miles, let's go. Miles, you only rang four times. I see. Well, I'll take this. Thank you for your help, I suppose. Well, actually, what's going on here? Everybody's giving me things that they think I want rather than what I've asked for. This is a bit strange. Do you think, church family, do you think that my friends here, have, have they helped me here? Have they uh, respected me in what I've asked for? Shaked heads. Do you think that they, have they obeyed what I've asked them to do? Not really. They kind of did a little bit of... They did a little bit of what I wanted. They got me something or they did something. But then they added their own little twist and thought, you know, it's, it's good enough. That'll do. Well, in today, uh, in Flames and Sparklers, we're looking at the same thing as you guys are in here, the adults. And we're going to be seeing about how Saul, again, disobeys God by nearly doing what God wants, but not quite, not perfectly. And he does actually what he decides to in the end. Well, because we're all uh, thinking about the same thing today, make sure that you uh, ask a young person after tea and coffee what you learned, because you'll both be learning the same thing. Well, our next song today, is gonna be we're going to be learning about the character of God, because even though we're sinful and we don't do what God wants, or we go part of the way there and do what we want then, God is always good throughout all time. So please stand with me when the music starts, and we're going to sing Noah Built the Most Enormous Boat. Noah built the most enormous boat kept the birds and animals afloat the lord was good the lord was strong and noah lived his life for him moses led his people through the sea taking them away from slavery the lord was good the lord was strong and moses lived his life for him oh thank you oh thank you that all through history you were faithful thank you oh thank you that you are just the same when it comes to me when it comes 
comes to me. Thank you very much indeed. Now we're going to share some church family news uh, with us this morning. And um, well, we're continuing, as we said, the story of uh, Samuel uh, this morning, which we're looking forward to very much indeed. And uh, this week, all of our groups are restarting, so growth groups, uh, which are our small uh, groups that meet in homes to study the Bible, to pray and to encourage one another. If anyone's not in a growth group, uh, a new term, beginning of a new term, it's a great time to join one. So come and let us know if you'd like uh, to do that. Uh, and all of the other groups are restarting this week. So do be praying for Tot Shots, our uh, toddler group on Wednesdays, for Hot Shots, our primary school group on Thursday, uh, for In Touch, our over 60s lunch, and for Ignite, our teens group uh, that starts next Sunday uh, evening. Uh, also coming up very soon is our annual church meeting and we love our annual church meeting to be a, a fun and enjoyable evening uh, and uh, we're starting off uh, with four interviews uh, from different members of our church and leadership and hearing what God has been doing in their lives and what they've been doing in this last year and there'll also be a video photo review of the year so you can be reminded of all of God's goodness to us in the last 12 months. We'll share puddings. There'll be elections uh, for PCC members and church wardens, and there'll be a time to look ahead and pray for the future together. So I do hope you can come a week on Wednesday. It's in here uh, this year, and a really important evening to share uh, with our church family. Uh, and coming up also, we have a uh, bring and share lunch. And I think, Victoria, you're going to say a few words about that. Good morning, everybody. Um, just a really quick notice to remind everybody, it's been in the newsletter. Um, on Sunday, the 28th of April, it's the last Sunday that Nick's going to be here with us for a little while. Um, so we thought we'd probably better not let him just slope off. We should have um, a nice time together after the service. Um, we're going to do a bring and share lunch. It was a huge success the last one we did last February. Um, it's very little effort. Just bring enough food for you or your family plus two. And then there is more than enough for us all to share. Um, there'll be no organized fun afterwards. It'll literally be eat, chat, and have some good time together. So do come along if you can. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. 
And my final notice this morning is to say that if Ruth has written to you, uh, Ruth's our safeguarding officer, if she's written to you asking for some certificates of your training, please send them to her so that she can give an accurate uh, report at the annual church meeting so that we're fully doing all that we can uh, with safeguarding. The rest of the church family news is in the weekly news, uh, so do uh, read that. Uh, It comes out by email. If you don't receive it, let us know and we'll add you to the list. Let's pray now for our young people before they uh, make their way out. Heavenly Father, thank you for all of our young people's groups, for Kresh, Sparklers, Flames, and Ignites. And we pray for them all this morning as they also uh, look at your word together. May you speak to them, uh, Heavenly Father, and help them this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, just before you go, just to say that Ignite are going out as well at, the same, at this time. Uh, so uh, do make your way out too. And as they all head out, have a moment to chat if you'd like to, to someone near you. Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps you can continue your conversations after our church service is over, over coffee. We turn now to our scripture reading, and we are reading chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, page 285. Page 285, 1 Samuel 15. Samuel said to Saul, I'm the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they were waylaid, when, when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go, attack the Amalekites 
and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. So Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Telaim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men from Judah. Saul went up to the city of, the, of, of, the, of Amalek, Amalek and set an ambush in the ravine. Then he said to the Kenites, go away, leave the Amalekites so that I do not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all of the, the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, to the east of Egypt. He took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. And all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag, and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and the lambs, and the lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I am grieved that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was troubled and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told Saul has gone to Carmel. There he set up a, mount, a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, what then is this bleating of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. Stop, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord has said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Make war on them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission that the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took the sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of, of, of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the people, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. 
As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe and it tore. Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. Saul replied, I have sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went back with Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. Then Samuel said, Bring me Agag, king of the Amalekites. Agag came to him confidently, thinking, Surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among women. And Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. Then Samuel left for Ramah. But Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again. Though Samuel mourned for him, and the Lord was grieved that he had made Saul king over Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Do keep that open in front of you, and we need God's help, so let's uh, ask for that now. Our Heavenly Father, we pray, please, this morning, would you move among us by the power of your Spirit, that we would understand what you are saying to us, and we would listen to your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. In the lead-up to the, the Football World Cup a couple of years ago in Qatar, there was a great advert on in America. Jordan and I saw it while we were watching the NFL um, in this advert, they play on the, the different meanings of words that occur between Americans and the English. Uh, you'll recognize, I trust, David Beckham. The other guy in the advert is sort of the, the NFL's version of David Beckham. Uh, so here's a little clip. Beckham in the house. Watching a little soccer, nice. Bro, are you eating my lace? Yep. Wow. It's the FIFA World Cup. And it's football. All right, don't start. Those are chips. Crisps. Those are cleats on my chair. Boots. But that is soccer. No, my friend, that is football. Well, you can find the rest of that advert on YouTube. It, it, gets, it gets better. It's very funny. Um, but it asks a good question, doesn't it? When you hear the word chips, what do you think? Do you think fish and chips? Or do you think a packet of crisps? Do you think Lay's or do you think Walker's? That's what Walker's is called in America. When you hear the word football, do you think a round ball and Lionel Messi? Or do you think an over, over ball and Tom Brady or Louis Rhys Samet now? When you hear the word God, what do you think? What comes to mind? It's a difficult question, isn't it? It's an important question, though, because what comes to mind when we think God has an enormous impact on the way we live our lives, on what we do, on what we think is important. Some people will be very sure about the answer, and they'll say, fiction. And so the atheists will live their life without any thought of God. Others will be less sure. Maybe there's somebody out there, a sort of a divine clockmaker who wound the world up, has left it to go, and he has nothing to do with us now. Or a sort of big guy in the sky who, who I don't need to to have anything to do with normally, but if something goes wrong, I can call on him, or I can blame him. That's what we call deism. And I, I guess what, we, what that looks like is what we see most people living like in the Western world today. Perhaps you think of a pantheon of gods, uh, as many would in the East, uh, and in the Greco-Roman world, or maybe you think of pantheism. God is everywhere, in everything. Mother Nature is God. If you do believe in a, a sort of a God, then you might emphasize his power. That's the sort of Muslim uh, way of thinking. If you're a Christian, you might emphasize his goodness or his, his love. After the reading we've just heard, you might wonder, is God a genocidal maniac? And we'll come on to that. 
But all the way through 1 Samuel so far, we've, we're in the 15th chapter, we've been asking the question, will people trust in the Lord Almighty or in human might? And really, we've only seen three people fall on what a Christian would want to say is the right side of that line. We started with Hannah back in chapters 1 and 2, and she introduced us to this idea of not trusting in human might, but in the Lord Almighty in her song, her prayer. Her son Samuel has followed after her, and a couple of weeks ago, we saw Jonathan put his trust in the Lord. But everyone else, including Samuel's priestly predecessor, Eli, and his sons, and including now the first king of Israel, Saul, has over and over again chosen to trust in human might rather than the Lord Almighty. And it means that they've treated him like a a sort of domestic deity. We saw that back as we saw the Ark of the Covenant get taken uh, by the Philistines. People, including Saul, have only given the Lord sort of token trust rather than true trust. They've treated him as a God who can be taken or left, a big guy in the sky who we don't really have to have anything to do with. The result was in, verse, in chapter 8 that the Israelites rejected God as their king and asked for a king like all the other nations. And God said, fine. Here you go, have Saul. And Saul, we saw, was the king after the people's own hearts. And since we met him back in chapter 9, we've seen him fail to listen to God over and over and over again, treating God lightly. And now, as we heard in our reading, chapter 15 is the end of the road for Saul. Now the tall king is toast because he wouldn't trust God. Last week, Nigel helpfully uh, brought to our attention the fact that as we, as we examine the life of Saul, as we've been going through these studies in Saul for six chapters, God is holding up a mirror for us, inviting us to look in this Saul-shaped mirror and consider our own attitude to God. And as we conclude the story of Saul this morning, we're going to need to take a long, hard look into this mirror to reflect on Saul's life and so our own attitudes to God. A couple of weeks ago, Jordan invited us to join Jonathan in totally trusting God. But here in chapter 15, we're warned, don't join Saul in rejecting God and his words. But in that warning, there's also an invitation, an invitation to not treat God lightly like Saul does, but to treat him rightly. As Jesus says in John chapter 4, to worship him in spirit and in truth. We need to think about God rightly if we're going to do that. Verse 1 sets up the big theme of the chapter. As Samuel says to Saul, listen now to the voice of the Lord. And these two Hebrew words for, for listen and for voice or sound, they're going to be repeated over and over again through the chapter. We've seen that this happens in the book of Samuel before. There, there's repeated words over and over again. Some of these are going to be disguised in our English translations, but I'll try and point them out to you as we go. Listen to the voice of the Lord. But as we heard in our reading, that is what Saul fails to do. He can't, he, or he won't, hear God. But before we think about that, we need to think about why. Why won't Paul, Saul, hear God? Well, it's because when Saul thinks God, he doesn't think right. And so he doesn't fear God the first lesson for us in worshiping in spirit and truth we need to fear God I'm sure you know the story in the line in which in the wardrobe as the Pevensey children first uh, are finding out about Narnia they meet the beavers and the beavers start to tell them about Aslan and Mrs. Beaver says if there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking they're either braver than most or else just silly Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Typical uh, poignancy from C.S. Lewis there. And it helps us 
see that if we don't approach God in fear, with our knees knocking, then we're doing it wrong. And in this chapter, we see two examples of people doing that. And the first is the Amalekites. So verse 2, Samuel says, This is what the Lord Almighty says, I will punish or avenge, it could say, the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Well, what on earth is going on here? To understand it, we need to go back to the book of Exodus. As God says, the Amalekites waylaid the Israelites as they were coming out of Egypt. Israel is in the desert. They've just come through the Red Sea when the Amalekites jump them. That's what they do. They, they, kick, they catch them and attack them when they're weak. In the book of Deuteronomy, uh, Moses reminds the people of this as they're about to enter the land. And in Deuteronomy 25, Moses says, Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and attacked all who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. When the Lord your God gives you rest from all the enemies around you in the land, he is giving you to possess as an inheritance. You shall blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. Well, it's been the best part of 300 years since this happened. The people have been in the land for a long time. God has waited. He's been patient. In that time, any number of Amalekites or even the whole nation could have turned to God. Like we see in the book of Joshua, Rahab turns to God as they attack Jericho and she's saved. When the people come up out of Egypt, if you read in Exodus, a number of Egyptians come with them because they've recognized who God is. But, verse 18, that's not the case with the Amalekites. Verse 18, they are wicked people even now, and so God's vengeance is coming. God orders Saul to totally destroy the Amalekites. And you'll see there's a, there's a sort of footnote explaining that word. It's the Hebrew word haram. And it's a completely unambiguous word that means devote to destruction. It's a sort of sacramental thing. It's God's to, for God, you are to destroy everything. But this is not about genocide. This is about justice. Any Amalekite could have turned to God. It's not about a nation, it's about that nation's sin. It's about people's sin, and it's about God's justice. You need to think that this is rare even for God. Really, he does it here with the Canaanites and Joshua and with Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis. It doesn't really happen other than that. And he's patient every single time, waiting. Anyone who can, will turn to him will be saved. And it means that there's no warrant for this sort of action at any other time. So we can't take it to mean that. This is Yahweh avenging a wrong, executing his justice. And we know the need for justice, don't we? we we've seen um, what's been going on with the post office scandal, the largest miscarriage of justice in British history. 33 die without justice. And just this week, O.J. Simpson died, leaving this sort of bitter taste. Who, who knows whether justice was done? I read an article yesterday that said secrets have died with him and we'll never know. We desperately long for justice, don't we? Everybody does. And if we fear God, if we treat him rightly, then his justice will be a comfort to us. God is not nonchalant about injustice, about things that are wrong in his world. God does not take sin lightly. Unfortunately, though, Saul does. Saul treats God lightly, and he doesn't do what God said. We saw Jordan helpfully illustrate that for us. And in verse 8, it all comes out. So instead of destroying, Saul took Agag the king and spared the best of the cattle. They were unwilling to destroy completely uh, what was good. And verse 11, we see how God feels. He is grieved. I am grieved that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Sin grieves God. The sin of the Amalekites and the sin of Saul 
grieves God. Saul, on the other hand, is pretty pleased with himself in verse 12, and he goes up to Carmel to set up a monument in his own honor. Such is his disrespect for God. When in verse 13, Samuel catches up with him, Saul claims that he's done what he was asked to do. He claims innocence. And when he's challenged, well, he does exactly what we saw him do last week. He points the finger. He blames other people. Verse 15, the soldiers. Verse 21, the soldiers. And verse 24, we get to the heart of the issue. I was afraid of the people, and so I gave in to them. Afraid of the people, and so he didn't listen to God. And it's time for us to take a big, hard look in the mirror. It's a common problem today, isn't it? Being afraid of the people such that we then don't listen to God. I wonder for you, as you look into the mirror, who are the people standing behind you in the mirror who you're afraid of? Perhaps it's family members, friends, colleagues, your neighbors. Who are you afraid of such that you don't listen to God. We've seen that that is the case for Saul. He does not fear God, the God of angel armies, the God who has demonstrated time and again his power and supremacy over all things. He's the God who is totally other than us. He is the uncreated creator. We are his creation. He is infinite, stands outside of time. He created time. We are finite, bound by time. And in our finitude, we cannot understand what is infinite. Verse 29 highlights the difference. God, who, he who is the glory of Israel, does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. We sung that in our first hymn. There is no shadow of turning with thee highlights God's transcendent otherness. He is indescribable, uncontainable, incomprehensible. That's only highlighted to us further by the fact that this word in verse 29, which is translated change his mind twice, is the same word in verse 11 and 31, which, where God is said to be grieved. So God is grieved, but he cannot change his mind. Now, in one sense, the IV's rightly showing that the semantic range of that word. It can mean those different things. It's a word which sort of means to be sorry, to, to regret. But we're told that, that this, this word, God can, does do it, but he also can't do it. And I'd love to go into that now, but there's not time. It's for a Lent talk. But what it can do for us this morning is help us to see just how other than us God is. He, he exists outside of our framework of, of understanding of what can be true. What we can know about God is really just a drop in the ocean of what is true about him. We can know him truly. He reveals himself to us in his word. We spoke about that in our Lent talk this, one of our Lent talks this year. But if we think that we can understand everything about God, then we're, then we're mistaken. St. Augustine says that if you comprehend, it is not God you comprehend. If when you think God, you think of a God that you've got all sussed out, you understand him, and, and you sort of can approach him on, on your own terms, then you're not thinking about the God of the Bible. Saul, when Saul thinks God, he thinks wrong. And so he treats God lightly. And God is saying to us this morning, look into this mirror, don't be like Saul. Don't treat me lightly, treat me rightly. The first lesson in worshiping God in spirit and in truth is to fear God. The second lesson is then to hear God. Multiple times in the Bible we're told that it's those who fear God who listen to him and obey him. And that's what we're seeing played out in chapter 15. Because Saul doesn't fear God, he thinks it's optional to listen to God. He thinks that when God says, bring me an apple, he can bring a pear and that will do the job. And so he says to Samuel in verse 13, the Lord bless you. Haven't I carried out the Lord's instructions? 
And Samuel says, what then is this sound of sheep in my ears? There's that word, sound, voice. What is this sound of cattle that I hear? You have not listened to the sound, the voice of God. Saul is full of excuses. He blames other people. He says, I have kept the word of the Lord. And in verse 16, Samuel says, stop. Well, really, that's the, that's the sort of middle class, polite English translation. Samuel says, shut up and listen. Shut up and listen. Stop Pouring out excuses, you have not listened to God. We all know the frustration it, that, that it is to not be listened to, don't we? We'll all have experienced it. If you're a parent, you'll have experienced it in a particularly strong ways at different times. If you're a secondary school teacher, I suspect you have the most experiences of it, of anybody. My dad retrained about five years ago, having spent most of his career in the city, and now he's full of stories of teenage stupidity, and the excuses they come out with when they haven't done what they were asked to do. I'm sure Esther and Ted could tell us plenty of stories the same. But God will not accept excuses. And so he says, verse 22, Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed or to pay attention is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. God says, will you just listen? Are you paying attention to Yahweh? He says, no, nothing else, no amount of sacrifices will make up for that. No amount of Sundays spent in church, money given to church, time and energy spent serving in church, even time and energy spent studying the Bible can make up for listening to what God says and doing it. Think of the, the absent father or the, the repeatedly adulterous husband who thinks that apologies and presents will make up for it every time. And so as we take this final look into the soul-shaped mirror, God says to us, will you treat me lightly or will you treat me rightly? Instead of living under God's word, Saul stands over it and he finds himself rejected. I wonder if you found the finality of it shocking. Saul starts pleading, and Samuel says in verse 26, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today, and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. There's no way back for Saul now. Game over. Now we do see, and we should recognize, another example of God's patience and grace. Because this rejection, you see in verse 30, is a, is a private one. Samuel continues, continues to honor Saul before the rest of Israel. The rest of Israel doesn't seem to ever find out about this. And Saul is able to live out the rest of his life as the king until he dies. But he's been rejected as king by God. And he will be Verse 28, replaced by somebody better than you, one better than you. Saul has been the king after the people's own heart. The next group we're going to meet, the king after God's own heart. The trouble is this one better, he is certainly better than Saul, but he's not better enough. He still sins. In fact, he sins very, very, very seriously. His response is completely different to Saul, and that makes all the difference, but he remains one better, but not one good enough. And so we continue to wait in the Bible narrative for one who is even better. One who doesn't just hear God, but one who is God. He will be the king with God's own heart. One who had no sin, but died for our sin that we might be forgiven. We're going to celebrate what he did for us later on in our service as we share the Lord's Supper. We continue to celebrate it in this period of Easter. 
And during his life, during Jesus' life, there's a moment where he takes his closest disciples up on a mountain and he is transfigured. His glory as God is revealed to them and a voice comes from heaven and says, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Listen to him. God is calling us this morning to be quiet and listen. To come to Christ, not with a list of things we've done, our sacrifices, but with our wholehearted devotion is to hear. And so let me ask you again, when you think God, what comes to your mind? When you think God, what comes to your mind? If it's not a God who makes you tremble, makes your knees knock, then it's not the God of angel armies. If you think you've you've got him all sussed out, it's not Yahweh. If it is the Lord Almighty, the one true God, then you won't treat him lightly. You won't even think about trying to stand over his word instead of sitting under it. You will fear him and you will hear him and growing to know him more closely and understand him more deeply and obey him more fully will be the greatest joy to you. If you want to begin to taste, to get into what that little drop in the ocean looks like, then let me recommend this book to you, None Greater. It's in our church bookstore online. Um, it's where that quote from Augustine came from. Um, it will help you to, to, to see a bit more of what we can know about God. It will also help you to see how big the ocean is of what we can't know about God, how much greater he is than us. Well, as you look into this soul-shaped mirror one last time, what do you see? What do you see? Where do you treat God lightly? Thinking you can get by pretty well without him? Trusting in human might? Where are you standing over God's word instead of sitting under it? Coming to scripture with more of a a critical eye than a humble heart? When you look in this mirror, do you see someone who is totally devoted to Jesus? Jesus is calling you today to hear the warning of Saul before it's too late, before that finality that Saul feels comes to us when Jesus returns, when excuses won't get us anywhere. Will you accept the invitation this morning to treat God rightly? to worship him in spirit and in truth. Let me pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we pray, please, for your spirit's work in our hearts. Help us to see ourselves rightly in the mirror and so to treat you rightly as you deserve to be treated. Help us when we think God to think of you Help us to see you more clearly and love you more dearly each day. And so to worship you in spirit and in truth. We're going to sing together now a song which is going to invite us to respond. I invite you to stand, but you may prefer to remain seated as we consider what it looks like to offer up our life in spirit and truth. To come to the Lord Jesus with wholehearted devotion. So please stand if you'd like to, uh, but do take this opportunity to, to do some business with God. true. 
all of love as my worship to you. In surrender I must give my every part. Lord, receive the sacrifice of a broken heart. Give what can I bring to so faithful a friend, loving a king, Savior? What can be said? What can be sung? Praise of your name, things you've done, all my words could not tell. Even in part of the dead of love that is owed by this thankful heart. You deserve my every breath, for you pay the great cost, giving up your life to death. Even death on a cross, you took all my shame away, that defeated my sin. Open up the gates of heaven and have beckoned me in. Savior, what can I give? What can I bring to so faithful a friend, a loving a king? Savior, what can be said, what can be sung? A praise of your name for the things you've done. Oh, my words could not tell, even in part of the dead of love that is owed by this thankful heart. Thank you. Do remain standing. And uh, we have now uh, coming on the screen the words of uh, a creed. And this is a way to respond to uh, what we've been thinking about, what Stephen's been saying, responding to God as he really is by declaring our belief and our trust in him. So if you would like to respond in the words, uh, use the words in bold. Let me ask you, do you believe and trust in God the Father? source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist. I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? I believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sit to pray. And we'll begin with the prayer that Jesus taught us. So as Jesus taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to continue in prayer, and Hannah is leading us. Our prayer themes for this morning are, in addition to current world events, are the work of STEP, which is the St. Albans and Harpenden Christian Education Project, and also children and youth work. Shall we pray? Father God, we look at the world and recognize how we have damaged and destroyed both your creation and each other. 
The scale of destruction from war-torn cities to burnt-out rainforests leaves us feeling helpless and longing for your return when you will fix this brokenness. But now we pray for you to raise up wise leaders who will seek paths of peace and restoration, to reduce human suffering, bring compassion and protect what we can. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for STEP and their work in our local community and schools to provide religious studies, assemblies and courses. We thank you for all the schools where STEP are able to work, and we ask that you would protect the relationships that have been built so that the schools would continue to be receptive and encouraged by STEP's involvement. Please provide all the ongoing financial resources that they need for this ministry, in particular a number of grant applications going in over the coming months. Thank you that they've been working with other organisations, including the development of after-school clubs, and we ask that this would bear fruit and grow. We pray that you would provide a new schools coordinator to work in the STEP team, who will slot into the existing team well and bring fresh enthusiasm to promoting STEP to teachers and schools. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you for all the children's groups here at Holy Trinity. We are blessed with the opportunity to teach our own children, church family children and others from our local community. And we thank you for everyone in the church who is part of this ministry. We pray for Polly as she heads up this work with the rest of the staff team and members of the congregation. Thank you for her great enthusiasm for faithfully teaching the gospel to our young people and how that encourages all of us. As materials are prepared by leaders each week, we ask that you'll provide the time and inspiration that they need so that they can grow themselves and teach joyfully. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be at work in our children, planting your truth in their hearts and minds so that they will all grow into men and women that know, love, and serve you. We pray for Hotshots that meets here on a Friday after school, and we ask that you would resource this work with the people that it needs to continue. Thank you that each week these children and their families are consistently exposed to your word and truths, and we pray that many would be brought into your kingdom through this contact. We pray for the upcoming Hotshots Summer Club. We pray for the extensive planning, logistics, and administration that are involved in delivering the Summer Club. Thank you that it has previously been a time of great blessing for all involved, and we pray that you would again be at work this summer. Lord, you know all that we need to be able to smoothly run Hotshots, so we ask that you would please provide all necessary help, leaders, crash, music, tech, admin, tea, coffee, so that we faithfully share you and your love with our local children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, we pray for members of our congregation living in Minster Court and Albany Gate. We pray that they would be salt and light in those places and that you would be at the center of their homes. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your son our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Hannah, very much. We're going to come shortly to share bread and wine. We're going to do it in the way that we did it on Easter Sunday, which is not the way we've generally been doing it recently, uh, and that is that when the wardens in invite you, uh, if you come up and take a, a small cup from uh, here, uh, and then I'll be standing just in front of the lectern here with the bread, and uh, after you've received bread, uh, if you're on this side of the church, go this way. If you're on that side of the church, go that way. And Nigel and Stephen will be standing back with the wine cups to serve you. Uh, and then there are empty bowls on each side for you to drop uh, your cups in once you've used them. And uh, just an encouragement that all baptized believers of whatever Christian tradition are welcome to join us around the Lord's table but there are two things that we want to do to prepare for that because in the Bible we're encouraged to come at peace with God. Uh, we've heard a challenging talk this morning and uh, it's an opportunity, isn't it, now just to come and make our peace with the Lord uh, and also uh, to be at peace with one another in a church family. And so we're going to do those two things now. We're going to have a prayer of confession and then remind one another of the peace that we have together. Uh, let me read a couple of sentences from the Apostle John to encourage us to pray this prayer. He says these famous words. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all 
unrighteousness. So let me invite you, if it's right for you, to come and confess. God of mercy, we acknowledge that we are all sinners. We turn from the wrong that we have thought and said and done and are mindful of all that we have failed to do. For the sake of Jesus who died for us, forgive us for all that is past, and help us to live each day in the light of Christ our Lord. Amen. May God Almighty, who sent his Son into the world to save sinners, bring us his pardon and peace, now and forevermore. Amen. I invite you to stand. And I'm going to share these words. Let's share these words together. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Let's offer one another a sign of peace. Do take a seat. And uh, I, I forgot to say that, but if for any reason taking bread and wine isn't, isn't right for you this morning, uh, you can either stay where you are or you can come up and uh, I'll pray a prayer blessing uh, with you. And also, I also forgot to say, we do have al- non-alcoholic wine as well, if that is something that you would like. If that's the case, just let Nigel uh, and Stephen or Stephen know and they will fetch it for you. But let's pray as we come to the Lord's table. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in your tender mercy gave your only Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one offering of himself a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, offering and satisfaction for the sins of of the whole world. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray and grant that we, receiving these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death, and passion may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Amen. So draw near with faith. Take and eat this bread and drink this wine in remembrance that our Lord Jesus Christ gave his life for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
cross of Jesus is near. My own one stranger's chasing selfish dreams now want to praise alone. How could I know this honor? No one as you have loved. Beneath the cross of Jesus, see the children called by God. Beneath the cross of Jesus, the before the cloud, we follow in his footsteps where promised hope is found. How great the joy before us to Well, we're going to sing our final song together, lovely song that encourages us to focus on the Lord Jesus, to listen to him, to consider him and what he's done for us, that we can come before God confident our sins have been dealt with. So let's stand and sing, Consider Christ. source of our salvation that he should take the punishment for me that he was pure a lamb without a blemish he took my sins and nailed them to the tree my lord and god you are so rich in mercy Words alone are not sufficient thanks to take my life, transform, renew, and change me that I might be a living sacrifice. Consider Christ that he should trust his father in the garden of Gethsemane. The full of dread and full of the anguish, he drank the cup that was reserved for me. My Lord and God, you are so rich in mercy, dear words alone, and all sufficient thanks to take my life, transform, renew, and change me, that I might be a living sacrifice.
Spirit of Christ, for death he has defeated, and he arose a bit for all to see. And now he sits at God's right hand in heaven, where he prepares a resting place for me. My Lord and God, you are. Let's remain standing for a final blessing. In fact, let's, uh, let's wait a moment, shall we? And just a reminder of a couple of things. There's a prayer corner at the back of church. Uh, should you like to make use of that? And uh, one of us will be waiting near there. Uh, our Ignite group are serving uh, refreshments today for the first time, uh, so do stay and uh, receive that from them, and let's enjoy time together. And that's through the doors uh, behind in the parish centre. But let's have a word of blessing. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Thank you.